Dutcher Kellner, uh, the good well-being happiness rock star, at least for me. So <laughs> I think that you have many instruments to make a, a whole um, composition. So welcome to the World Happiness Agora. And we want to focus on happiness and work and yeah. happiness and ourselves. So can we really have both work and happiness at all? Well, Luis, first of all, thank you for having me. And, and I think that your question, um, can we be happy and can we be happy at work, are, is, is one of the most important questions that people are asking about 21st century work. Um, and I think that um, what we know from a lot of survey data today is people are really stressed out at work. They feel very often disconnected from their work. They feel really critically that their work does not give them meaning or purpose. Uh, and so your question is, I think the most vital question that we should be asking about work today is how do we create work contexts? How do we cultivate our own minds in ways that, that bring greater happiness and meaning from work? And, and I think that there are a lot of positive answers to that question. So I think, yes, we can. And, and that's really one of the most important things to take on right now. So if we can, how do we do it? Well, I think, I think the first thing that we need to do, and, and I always think it's really important to think about happiness at multiple levels of analysis, right? So the first thing you know, that we know, for example, in the United States is, uh, and other countries, is that if you are doing really stressful work and you're not being paid enough and there's economic inequality, you'll be less happy. So part of the answer is structural, right? Which is how do we pay people? What kind of work do they do? Uh, but probably more relevant and more actionable to our conversation is, first of all, is how do you cultivate your mind, right? Inside your head, how do you approach work? And there's a, a lot of neat new research showing, and you know, we profile this at the Greater Good Science Center, like building in a little mindfulness each day, right? And, and really developing a practice of breathing and contemplation and mindfulness helps people um, in a lot of different ways at work, right? I think it's really important. The second big theme in the work literature is, does your work really correspond to your strengths and your purpose, right? Some people really care about justice. Some people care about innovation. Some people care about helping the suffering. Some people care about developing beautiful, creating beautiful things, right? Those are different strengths or passions. And so it really is incumbent upon organizations to find people in the right way. So there are a lot of things you can do in your mind. Um, and then I think you need to think about your relationships at work, you know, and, and really practice gratitude, uh, learn how to cooperate, learn how to handle conflict, you know, which always happens at work. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do, and it's a very timely moment. So we know that most people leave their jobs because of their manager, right? Or the boss. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do, what do you recommend in order yeah. to have more mindful or more conscious managers? What do we Yeah. Do? Thank you for, for reminding me of that, Luis. Um, you know, for um, 20 years, uh, I've studied happiness. And for 20 years, and I wrote about that in Born to be Good, and then for 20 years I've studied power and leadership, and I have this new book out, The Power Paradox, so it's a couple of years old. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the amount of suffering that leaders and managers cause when they, when they stray from the principles of happiness and kindness is, is, is extraordinary. I mean, like you said, Luis, most people leave, people get really stressed out at their work if their manager is disrespectful and inconsiderate and non-empathetic. They will leave their work if they're treated that way. They don't do good work when they're there if they're led by a coercive boss. So I think what you're doing right here in terms of reminding leaders to be kind, to listen, to say thank you, to practice gratitude, to empower others. And I write about this in The Power Paradox. Um, not only will they feel better about their work, but the people around them will work better. 
So it's critical that you profile that. Um, it, it's interesting because one of the topics of your research is teasing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's in, in, interesting as a subject because it's so deep, but it's so real. Yeah. Uh, what is the role of teasing in, yeah. in the work? Yeah. Thank you for being such a careful reader of my work. I really appreciate it. So, you know, when, you know, I've taught leaders for 20 years and, you know, when you're around great leaders and managers, the thing that you really realize is they, they often excel in the really subtle stuff, the stuff face to face, right? In the moment. Yeah. They have a philosophy and, you know, and they know how to inspire people, but a lot of the hard work of leadership is face to face. And my lab's really been interested in, in things like, you know, that are really tricky at work. Like, how do you encourage someone with a nice pat on the back and touch without making it inappropriate, right? And great leaders encourage, we have studies of this through pats on the back and so forth, but not being inappropriate. And teasing, there's no more fine line that you have to really navigate, right? That if you tease in really harsh ways, or they're overly direct, or you're not lighthearted, you really hurt people's feelings, right? But great leaders, the studies show, great managers, people who have a lot of respect in social networks, they have a really amazing way of just being really lighthearted, playful, laughing, self-deprecating, where they sort of tease themselves. Here's a foolish thing I did, right? And they create this sense of a spirit in their organization of, Hey, it's okay to make mistakes, right? It's part of great work to make mistakes. Hey, it's okay uh, to be lighthearted at particular moments because we know laughter frees people's imaginations up. So to tease really well, you have to make sure that you're being silly, make sure that you're delivering the tease in really playful ways, make sure it's not too critical about somebody's character, it's focusing on funny things or uh, mistakes people make and just be lighthearted about it. And it turns out to be a really good tool for healthy workplaces, the right kind. It's so interesting uh, thinking how actually teasing could become one of those techniques for yeah. mindful leaders, right? Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, there's this, you know, one of the critical ideas in mindfulness, Luis, as you know, is, is really to be lighthearted and to be non-judgmental right? And to, to know that we all, that our condition is transient. The thoughts in our head are transient. Um, that the mistakes we make at work change into opportunities for growth, right? And new innovations. And I think one of the things that the right kind of lighthearted tease does is it says, hey, it's okay. You know, you, you, you know we misfired on that project, we made a little, we went in the wrong direction. It's kind of silly what we did and let's move on, right? So I do think it's a very counterintuitive mindfulness technique. Really, I, I really appreciate you bringing that into focus. Thank you so much because it's quite unique the research you've done uh, about the topic. Um, it, I've been in the corporate world, so I know how, for example, when you're in a public company yeah. and you know that anything that might happen can have an impact on the share value. Yeah. Uh, there are managers that really freeze and it's like, mm, they rather have everything under control yeah. used here that basically creating a, a space of openness and a flexibility. How, yeah. how can we convince uh, managers and people that they have to lose control in many ways in yeah. order to get the best out of people? Yeah, wow, you are really hitting the very core of, of um, what I've been studying and thinking about for 25 years. You know, I think the central theme of, of great leadership that I wrote about in the power paradox toward the end is, is what you said is empowerment, right? Which is that great leaders, great managers, great parents, great romantic partners, they empower other people. They don't dictate how they're to do the thing, things or coerce them or push them, especially in today's 21st century workplace, right? We're moving away from 
hierarchical organizations of titles to more dynamic um, sort of horizontal type organizations. Um, and, and, you know, the, the principle of empowerment, in my view, uh, brings out the best in, in other, in teams and in, in units and organizations. There's work by Cameron Anderson at UC Berkeley showing when leaders have this more empowering style, the people around them make better decisions, right? They are, they make more productive efforts at work as opposed to a more top-down coercive model. And I think the way we convince managers and CEOs and, and others to your question is with hard data, right? With, with wow, this style of leadership leads to, um, we documented this in the U.S. Senate, it leads to more success. This style of leadership leads to fewer sick days at work. This style of leadership leads to more better morale and those data are starting to come in um, and to be taken really seriously. So what is the style of leadership that we need uh, for the 21st century to create a happier world? Yeah, you know, so, I mean, and I, you sound like my editor at my book. My book. <laughs> <laughs> she said, and she's one of the best editors in the world, she said, you know, I mean, this is all great science on the science of empowerment and how we want to not abuse power. Um, but what do we do, right? <laughs> and I wrote a Harvard Business Review piece on that as well. And, and I think, you know, the first thing, and Luis, I think you're ahead of the curve, is to be mindful, right? Is to really, for leaders and people in, in management positions and everybody at work to build up a culture and a, a mindset of mindfulness, right? And just to be taking a moment each day to reflect on where you are in the work, how are you treating people, and, and to do it in a contemplative way that has the dimensions of mindfulness. I think the second core principle is empathy. Um, and we know that power and the abuse of power undermines our empathy. And that manifests in really simple things like, are you asking people questions, right? That's a great tool of empathy. Are you letting others speak first or have the floor in team meetings or conversations? How deeply are you listening to people? Um, and you know, the great leaders really like have moments in the day, even though they're really busy of really listening, right? So that's a, a second core principle. And to me, the, the third key is gratitude is cultivate a culture of appreciation and respect, you know, and, and really leaders, we know studies show as you rise in hierarchies, gain more power, sometimes you lose the subtle skills of gratitude. You stop saying thank you, you interrupt people, you, um, you are not as respectful of, of where they are at that moment at work. Uh, and so I think we have to stay close to mindfulness, empathy, and gratitude, and, and a lot of good things flow out of that. Mm. Do you think this change depending on culture or um, context? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and thanks for asking that because, um, you know, cultures, um, you know, I've taught, you know, I've worked with leaders from Brazil and Norway and UAE and China and Japan, I mean, all over the world, Russians, Uzbekistan. And, you know, you, these concepts, mindfulness, empathy, gratitude, really shift in different cultures, right? And so um, in some cultures that prioritize respect, like in Japan, um, you really want to really amplify the importance of respect and gratitude. Some cultures, like South American cultures, uh, very often have more expressive ways of showing respect and gratitude, right? Or empathy of touch and embracing and laughing. And you want to fine tune how you implement these principles depending on the culture. Uh, and, and I think that that comes out of humility and recognizing the cultural background of people you're working with. Um, but it's fundamental is to remember the cultural context. Um, one of the topics that you talk about a lot, I think, and you did a lot of research, is is morality, right? Yeah. How do you yeah. Morality. 
And yeah. I think the world we are living today, it requires a lot of mm. morality in many ways. Yeah. Um, is, do, you, do you link morality to happiness as well? And do you do this with uh, work environments? What a God, what a fascinating question. So, you know, the, it's interesting because um, the field of morality has come to the belief that, first of all, so much of our life is filled with morality. You know, it's not just when we violate a law and we end up in court uh, and then we're punished. Morality is do you treat people in your community with respect? Morality is do you are you true to your word, right? Morality is, are you kind and considerate in your, your demeanor? When you're around the Dalai Lama, as I've been a couple of times, you, you see how kind he is towards other people how, and how fundamental his moral stance to the world is to, to the well-being of the people around him. And, and I think that the, the, you know, your question, um, some people would say that work is not about morality, it's about the bottom line, and that's a mistake, right? Some people would say happiness isn't about morality, it's about pleasure and so forth. But I think your question points to a different answer, which is that we have to take our, the morality and the consequences of our actions seriously to think about how they relate to happiness. So there's a, a growing literature, Luis, on injustice and economic inequality. And Ed Diener was the first to document that in countries where there's a lot of inequality, like the United States, um, and in states in the United States where there's a lot of inequality, like California, people tend to be less happy, right? That you feel agitated. Um, so we need to take that seriously. And, and that's a very robust effect. Uh, we also know in cultures that, al that really respect individuals, right? Where you allow people, you empower people to speak up, to say their views, um, those cultures are happier. So we need to really, really shift our mindset. And, and I love your question, Luis, because there's such a temptation to say, ah, oh, Wall Street's not about morality, it's just about the bottom line. But that's a, that's a big mistake. And then of course we have to think about climate change, that. Uh, there are data showing, you know, that changes like in California, we just had these um, massive fires with the worst air in the world for a week that, that climate scientists have been predicting for 20 years. They happened in my area and the well-being of the whole state dropped, right? We lost work days. So we've got to be taking very seriously the moral connections to happiness. Wow, thank you so much for this answer. Um, when, when we think of happiness, I think that we have two different sides of the coin. We have the internal way yeah. of understanding happiness, and then we have the conditions to happiness. Yes. Yeah. Some of the research shows that conditions are not as important, but countries such as Bhutan, actually, they yeah. all focus on the conditions to happiness. Yes. How do we reconcile conditions with the internal development around happiness? Yeah, well, I think that, so first of all, the, the science on happiness, that's one of the claims that's really changed, right? So it used to be believed that 40 to 50% of happiness is in you uh, because of genetics, and then 30 to 40% is what you do with yourself, which we've been talking about, what do we practice, what habits do we cultivate? and 10 to 20% is the environment. And that estimate, Luis, was you know, based on, uh, it's really a 20 year old belief that was based on older views of genetics, that genetics, you know, once you have a gene, it leads to stuff. And now we have more sophisticated understanding of how the environment and the conditions, to use your word, shape your physiology. And we know if you have a nice family environment, it will lead to the expression of certain genes. We know if you're tragically have had trauma in your family life, that will influence your genes and be passed on to your kids, right? It's the, called the literature of epigenetics. So that literature is really changing to say, you need to think about both. 
the mind and you, and then what are the conditions, right? Do we have a lot of empowerment in, at work and that'll make people happier? Do we have a, a culture of respect and trust that will make people happier? So you are very rightly saying, let's really think hard about this balance of conditions and the person. Um, so you would focus, for example, we, we are at work and you are sitting with the CEO and yeah. the human resources yeah. manager of the organization. Um, where would you invite them to start with in order to change the culture or evolve the culture into a happy place? Yeah. So the way, um, you know, we just have an online class called The Science of Happiness at Work with edX with Emiliana Simon Thomas. And it took us about a year to answer your question. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's such a hard question. So what I really think is the first thing you have to do for happier organizations is to create opportunities for these practices we've been talking about, right? To think about your organization, think about the people in it, and build up opportunities, probably through leaders and human resources and the like of like, How do you give people a chance to practice mindfulness? How do you give people a chance to go on uh, to express gratitude at work and really think about the, the nuances of the workplace and, and, and go there? The second thing that's really interesting, uh, the second thing is really to work with leaders, um, as you've been suggesting in your questions, Luis, and really, you know, to, uh, and I do a bit of that work and, you know, through various forms, like to, really remind readers of how of leaders of how important empowerment is how big their influence is on people's lives how it's sacred in a way to lead and and then to cultivate a, a mindful leadership and and there's increasing movement as you know as you're doing towards that aim um a third thing is you know just to think about policies um that make for happier workers uh child you know parental leave, um, really taking seriously, as, as many people are now, um, don't text people after 6 p.m. about work, you know, um, or 5 p.m., taking seriously the idea of vacation time. Uh, people work harder today than they did 40 years ago, and it's stressing them out. And, and then the th final thing is, is this is really, um, I think this is fascinating to think about, which is, to think about how you design the place where you work to make it a place of greater well-being, right? Is there, is there a green space? Is there, are there opportunities to be playfully interacting with your colleagues? Are there opportunities to share food? Um, what does the office space look like, right? My department just moved into a new building after 50 years in this old, horrible building. Um, And it's changed everybody's happiness, you know, because it's light and it's playful and we interact with each other. So I think thinking about leaders, thinking about creating spaces for mindfulness, thinking about design and policies are good ways to start. No bad. Uh, some company we have to reshape almost <laughs> everything. But some <laughs> companies probably are already ahead, right? That Do you have examples of anybody you think could be a role model, somebody we have to look at and learn from? Well, you know, that, that um, I would really encourage um, the, um, your listeners and audience, Luis, to go to the Science of Happiness podcast and the Greater Good Science Center website. Um, what we did in that is, you know, I'm a lab scientist and a teacher, and I don't specialize in case studies. But at the, um, in our, on our website, greatergood.berkeley.edu, for free, and then at edX, the Science of Happiness at Work, for free, we profile a lot of case studies of people, uh, you know, at, I think at Zappos and trucking companies and parts of healthcare organizations like Kaiser Permanente. It's really committed to really leading the healthcare world in some sense in thinking about wellness practices um, that of real practitioners who are doing the nitty gritty work 
uh, of organizations. So going back to the lab, um, yeah. <laughs> can, can we can we um, can we say that? And and this is something coming from literature that we've been reading that actually chasing happiness can get you to unhappiness. Yeah. <clears throat> So my colleagues, June Gruber and Iris Mouse here at UC Berkeley, have some findings showing that if you chase happiness um, and, and really yearn for it, uh, it may undermine the pursuit of happiness. And what I think is really important, Luis, and it's, it's really hard work, and it's actually got this ancient philosophical tradition in Eastern thought in particular, which is that the pathways to happiness of gratitude and kindness and listening, empathy, um, joy, awe, wonder, beauty, you know, um, uh, feeling, having great friends, what you, you can't force those things. You have to create the context in which they occur. And that's what you can really intentionally design. And then they will happen to you, right? And that, that's a really subtle difference, which is that you can't force it in the moment. You have to create a structure of your life and your work life to allow these sources of happiness to arise. So you can't force insight in mindfulness. You just got to make sure you give yourself 10 minutes a day to practice mindfulness, and then suddenly you'll, you'll find it. You can't force awe and wonder, which I study, rather... You've got to say to yourself, I got to go for a hike two days a week in a city, a beautiful part of a city or out in nature, and then suddenly you feel it. So it, it is something we can really mislead ourselves by forcing it. And, and you, but we have to think about design of, of what a healthy life is. Mm, so important. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned awe. Yeah. I think that you've done some research too about awe and the role of awe in management. Yeah. So can we talk a bit about that? Because between teasing and all, maybe we can we can get more <laughs> cool managers, right? Yeah. Well, you know, what we do know, and it's so interesting, you know, there's a really interesting literature, um, for example, reviewed by a fellow named Jason Siegel at Claremont University, um, and about elevation, this interesting relative of awe called elevation. Elevation is where you are inspired by other people, right? And you encounter their moral goodness or something they've done uh, or how generous they are, and, and it moves you to do good work, right? Um, I recently, there's a movie out called Free Solo uh, of this rock climber named Alex Honnold, uh, and Alex Honnold climbs without ropes this part of Yosemite called El Capitan. And when people see it, he's just a young guy. You're, you're moved to uh, want to be better, right? And so I think, you know, it's so interesting. No one's made this connection empirically, but I think it makes sense, um, which, is, which is that we, if I don't lead in a healthy, moral way, the people around me aren't inspired, right? They aren't elevated, they don't feel awe. Uh, they don't feel like they can do better, right? But, and so we really, first thing that leaders need to really think about is, is their capacity to inspire is rooted in being kind and, um, and to remember that. And then the second thing that's so interesting to me is um, I think robust leaders, strong leaders, allow other people to inspire their teams, right? And they they really profile the great work of the people around them. And suddenly, if you're part of that team, you're being elevated and awestruck by your colleagues, right? And inspired by what they do. So I think it's part of really shifting how we think about power and leadership. Beautiful. What is the, what is the future of happiness? Where, where is the latest um, research? Uh, where are you getting the data? What's, what's going to happen? Well, I think that I think um, I think the future is in you know design. So, okay, this is a great science, uh, and you've been really pushing this, Luis. Which is 
we kind of, we have a good story about the science. There are 15, 20 things you can do, right, that we've been talking about from optimism to silver linings to self-compassion to gratitude to beauty. Um, and now the challenge is to design stuff, right, is how do you design a workplace around those principles? How do you design – We there are new data uh, in the United States of Roz Chetty, uh, who's at Harvard, I think, or Stanford, that there are certain neighborhoods that – create opportunities in certain neighborhoods that don't, right? And what is it, how do we design the neighborhoods uh, that build up opportunities for kids? Uh, how do we design schools or hospitals? And, and so I think that's gonna be really fertile. I think the other big question um, is, and it's related to your question about forcing happiness, which is individualization, right? Which is happiness maybe the most personal question you can ask somebody, right? Which is, mm -hmm. where do you find happiness? What, what principles really move you and what principles aren't so important? And so I think there are gonna be a lot of developments where through machine learning and you know, automated data and interesting kinds of data, we'll be able to say, this is what really, this is the path for Luis. Or this is the path for Dacker, path for Dacker to pursue happiness. And, and that'll take some interesting developments, but it's going to be very influential. Wow, how, um, how spectacular this conversation is. Uh, <laughs> just one, <laughs> one, one last question, if you sure. want, or you may. Um, uh, basically, as whole beings, we have live our lives at work, at home, at school, with our families and so on. Uh, how do you balance and how, how can we design strategies for whole being development? What comes to your mind from a research perspective? Wow. Um, well, I think, I, think, I think there are a couple of really important principles. Um, you know, uh, I think the first is to take the stress literature really seriously. And, um, and I teach that in human happiness, that happiness really, you know, in terms of design principles um, and rethinking work, um, the stress literature is robust. And it says, wow, if you're feeling stressed, um, your work is compromised, your health is compromised, your work relationships are compromised. So what are the parts of the workplace that directly produce stress uh, and work on that, right? And it's going to vary from one workplace to another, right? Uh, maybe it's too much work or not enough parental leave or not enough social time. And really, you know, to use that as a, a compass or a guidepost. Um, I think that, you know, I think... Um, there will be, um, there are going to be interesting convergent, um, almost like covenants uh, at work where it's like, okay, we're Adobe, this is our company, and what are the principles that really produce happiness in this workplace? And let's, you know, as important as the bottom line and you know, the official policies and human relations policy or human resources policies are going to be these principles. And increasingly, organizations are doing that work, Luis, you know, and your this conversation hopefully will inspire that. Like, as important as parental leave or almost as important or um, sexual harassment stuff is a set of policies about being happy in this company. Um, and that people can do. And I've been part of that and it's totally tractable. So I think we can do that. And then I think the leadership thing is really critical that leaders have to, alongside the bottom line, just be thinking about happiness. Um, and, and that will produce a lot of change. Well, thank you so much for all these 20 plus years of research and wisdom. Keep it, keep it up and you are doing amazing work and the center and yeah. thank you so much for being part of this conversation and being part of the world happiness agora thank you so much thank you so much Luis. it was a privilege okay bye bye <laughs> see you soon